something that we all face at some point in our lives, which typically comes from loss, be it the loss of a relative, a friend, a love, your own identity, a pet, your lifestyle, and so on. However, it is most commonly experienced due to the threat of death, such as through an incurable disease or some other horrific incident. Typically, grief manifests itself in a series of emotions known as the Kubler-Ross model, or five stages of grief, which was first introduced in 1969 by a psychiatrist named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book On Death and Dying. These stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, are common emotional stages one goes through when facing an all-too-harsh reality, such as death, disease, dismemberment, and overall loss. However, though these are the most common stages of grief, this neither covers the entire range of emotions, nor does everyone who grieves go through all the stages in the same order. Sometimes, people go out of order, and sometimes, they'll skip entire stages. I'm sure by now, most of you are aware that the locations in Termina represent each of the five stages of grief. Clocktown is denial, Woodfall is anger, Snowhead is bargaining, the Great Bay is depression, and Icona Canyon is acceptance. If you are, however, unaware of this, a simple Google search will bring you all kinds of articles and videos talking about the five stages of grief and how they were used in the development of Termina. Though, I am going to touch on these areas of Termina, that's not exactly what I'm here to talk about. You see, it actually goes beyond the fact that the land of Termina and the residents of this land showcase the Kubler-Ross model. There are three characters in particular that are going through their own stages of grief, but in very distinct ways. The first, and probably most obvious character, is none other than the hero of time himself. Link's struggle to come to terms with the loss of his friend Navi is very clear the moment the game begins. The second character is none other than Link's foe, the Skull Kid. If you listen to the story of Angie's grandmother, you learn that prior to the events of the game, Skull Kid was abandoned by his friends and mistreated by the citizens of Termina. Furthermore, you learn that the Skull Kid is none other than the one that Link met during his travels through Hyrule, who was an outcast among his own kind during his time in Hyrule. In fact, the only person who showed Skull Kid any kindness was Link himself when he taught Skull Kid Saria's song and gave him the Skull Mask. However, by the time you meet him in the game, he has become consumed by the evil of a mask he stole from the Happy Mask Salesman and is now lashing out against Termina in a very devastating way. The final important character in all of this is Link's companion, Tattle, who was abandoned by the Skull Kid at the beginning of the game, and the game hints that ever since Skull Kid obtained the mask, he became abusive to her and her brother Tail. In fact, it even shows Skull Kid slapping Tail when he tried to tell Link and Tattle what they had to do to save Termina from the wrath of the Skull Kid. As I said before, not everyone goes through the stages of grief in the same order, and they don't even always go through all the stages. These three are no different. Each experiences and expresses their grief in drastically different ways, and the best way of looking at it is to look at each of the stages of grief in relation to each character. So. Let's get right to it and look at the first stage shown in the game, depression. Now, when thinking about the locations of the game, people naturally think of the first location as Clocktown, which personifies denial. However, it's easy to forget that the lead up to Clocktown takes place in the Lost Woods. When the game starts out, after the text telling the story of Link's accomplishments during Ocarina of Time and his current journey to find a lost friend, the game opens on Link riding upon a through what can only be assumed to be the Lost Woods. However, Link is clearly troubled. His head is hanging. He's not really paying attention to where he's going. I mean, it seems like he's completely withdrawn into himself. This, my dear viewers, is textbook depression. Anyone who has ever experienced true depression will tell you that it will stop you dead in your tracks. It sits on you like a weight, dragging everything you do down and making your life miserable and at times unbearable. Depression affects every part of your life, making you unproductive, hard to be around, detached from those you care about, reckless, and even suicidal. Very few people make it out of depression without the help of medication, and more still ultimately take the permanent way out. Furthermore, depression goes beyond simple emotions and is something that affects the internal chemistry of your brain, making it nearly impossible to overcome without help of some sort. 
This is where we find Link at the beginning of the game, withdrawn deep into himself into the depths of his depression at being abandoned by his truest friend, the one who had stood with him through the horrors he faced as he journeyed to save Hyrule from the evil Ganondorf. However, Link manages to overcome his depression early on in the game when he finds another world which needs him to save it. This is the extraordinarily rare thing about Link's character that makes him such a great hero. He is able to set aside his own feelings for the good of everyone else. Or is he? I mean, even with that understanding of Link's personality, isn't it odd that Link so suddenly gets over his depression in order to trudge forward on a journey to save people he doesn't know in a world he has no attachment to? Typically, depression makes a person apathetic to the needs of others, distant and detached from the people around them. It's extremely odd for a depressed person to set out on such a dangerous and arduous journey to save complete strangers, no matter how heroic that person is. Either Link is a paragon of humanity, or something else is going on. Something much, much deeper. I think it is clear that something deeper is going on here. And that something deeper is denial. Nine times out of ten, and maybe even ten out of ten, people in denial are usually sitting squarely in one of the other stages of the grief, be it depression, anger, or bargaining. That's ultimately what denial is, to deny what else is going on, particularly your own emotions. And that is exactly what is going on with Link here. In no way has he gotten over his depression, and throughout most of the journey, he is simply denying that it exists. And fortunately for him, he has a lot going on to take his mind off his own problems. But what happens as soon as this is all said and done? Where is Link once his journey is over? He's right back where he started, riding upon a through the woods, head hanging low in deep depression once again. Link is unique among these characters, as the only stages of grief that he manifests are those of depression and denial. And even at that, his denial only covers the depression that he experiences throughout the game. So, what of Tattle and Skull Kid? When the game starts out, Tattle is clearly in denial. She's in denial of what Skull Kid has become, and the deadly length that Skull Kid is willing to go to ever since he got his hands on that mask. Once again, the game hints at the fact that Skull Kid became abusive to the fairies as the magic fueled his anger at all of those who wronged him. And she only joins Link in order to get back to Skull Kid, whom she still thinks of as a friend despite how he's been treating her. However, after traveling with Link for the first three days, she is unable to deny what Skull Kid has become, and upon seeing Skull Kid hit her brother, she goes from denial to anger. At that moment, she no longer sees Skull Kid as her friend, but as someone she used to love who has now become a monster. And all throughout the game, that anger bubbles beneath the surface of her being until the end. Skull Kid, however, is nothing but anger. He has been mistreated, abused, neglected, abandoned, and more. He was very angry at the world for what his life had become, and the mask only fueled that anger into blind rage. It is this anger, fueled by the evil of the mask, which led him to try to bring down the moon on Termina, killing everyone. Well, what about the final stage? Acceptance. Well, I'm happy to report that everyone finds their way through their grief and into acceptance. Skull Kid comes to accept that his friends have to leave, but he also knows that he has other friends that he can spend his time with. Tattle finds it in her heart to forgive Skull Kid for his abusiveness, when he was with the mask. And Link, well, Link learns that, uh, well, huh. Do you remember when I mentioned Link's depression at the end of the game? I mentioned that he's back where he started before meeting Skull Kid, Tail, and Tattle. Well, there's more to it than that. That scene is actually a post credit scene, so what is Link doing during the credits? He's hanging out, spending time with the people of Termina, apparently happy, but he's never there as himself. He's hiding behind the masks, pretending to be people that the masks transform him into. He appears to still be in denial, doing whatever he can and being whomever he can to avoid facing the stark reality of his loss of Navi. See, ultimately, that's the thing about grief. It is all-consuming, and not everybody makes it out. If 
there's one thing that you need to take from Majora's Mask. It is that fact. It is the all-consuming power of grief. And the fact that it can just tear someone down to the point that they see no way out of it whatsoever. And that's what happened with Link. Throughout his entire journey, nothing caused him to come to terms with the loss of Navi. The only silver lining to this is the scene after the credits where Link sees the stop. Sometimes a thoughtful action from a friend is all it takes to start the healing process. See you guys in two weeks. Thank you.